Hi, and welcome to Aid University. I'm Peter Urbanski, Associate Director of Marketing Science here at Eisenberg. And today we're going to talk about false trends in marketing data, or what we also call the Simpsons Paradox. After this short course, you'll be able to think more critically about the level of analysis of your data. You'll be able to identify and reduce instances of false conclusions due to this paradox, and you'll learn about how to start accounting for instances of Simpsons Paradox in your analysis. This course is great for analysts and data scientists trying to take analytics beyond simple correlations, taking their regressions to the next level of causal inference. This course is also great for people in leadership positions trying to understand performance marketing campaigns and to ask the right questions. So what is Simpson's paradox? It's where trends reverse when a data set is separated into separate groups. This means we observe the direction of the trend and then we look at our data as a whole and then when we slice it into individual groups of the data, it will change direction. It was first described by statistician Edward Simpson in 51 and finally named after him in 72. Um, it's a typical problem that we'll observe in any tiered data. It's common in advertising where things are tracked and deployed at multiple levels. For example, multiple audiences within a campaign, regions or channels. Before we get into paradox, let's quickly review some concepts like the level of analysis, also called unit of analysis. This is a level of aggregation that defines your analysis or your data set. You want your analysis research question and hypothesis to be the same level as your data. So ask yourself, what level are you making decisions? What does each row in your data represent? And ask also what kind of examples you can come up with. We have you know, individuals, consumers, regions, audiences. So what level of analysis are you actually looking at? You don't want to make false conclusions or what we'll call the ecological fallacy. That is when you're making inferences across the wrong level of analysis. For example, let's say we have a campaign level of data and we have click-through rates for all those different campaigns. We might find that campaign A has the highest average, so we might assume that ads within that campaign also have high click-through rates. So that's an incorrect inference to make. We know how the campaigns perform, but we really do not know how anything within the campaign is performing. We'll see some examples later. It's also an incorrect assumption to do this in the opposite direction, where there are some different but interesting reasons why. For example, you have survey results where their individuals are telling you that, you know, where they're going to research a product beforehand. Unsurprisingly, you'll find that people in the data set are more likely to purchase a product when they see high review scores, but you're assuming people will behave the same in a group. While less dangerous, inferring individual behavior to a group, it's still something you need to think about and be careful. People have behave differently when interacting together, when they talk about to each other about the products, you'll have the behavior of your competitors to watch out for. Things are just gonna be different on, out in the wild. Is this always gonna be a problem? No, but you should really always consider this in your analysis, you'll make better conclusions. And when possible, start with the lower levels of analysis or lower levels of granularity of your data. You can always aggregate up, but you can't aggregate down. However, always talk and think about the your level of your analysis at the same level as your data. Now let's get deeper into Simpson's paradox. Recall us where trends reverse when a data set is separated into the groups. Let's say we have a simple A-B test. We have data on conversions and leads for two creatives. For creative A, we see that there are 273 conversions on 350 leads for a 78% conversion rate. For creative B, we have almost 290 conversions on 350 leads for an 83% conversion rate. So great, creative B is better. But let's do some diagnostics on Simpson's paradox. We can split it into two audiences and take a look at you know, creative A first. Works out that creative A actually has a better conversion rate than creative B for audience A. For the second audience, Creative A again has a better conversion rate than Creative B. Creative A wins again. So in both audiences in isolation, Creative A wins. In this example, it's the conversion allocation between the two audiences that's having the effect. The 192 on the worst performing audience Y for Creative A is pulling down the total rate. Same thing for audience X on Creative B. What conclusion should we make? Figure out why audience X is only getting 87 leads. Can you squeeze out more performance out of that audience for creative A? If not, your conclusion would be to run creative A for audience Y and creative B for audience X. Let's move on to a more advanced example. Say you're looking at the correlation between click-through rates and conversions. You find that there is a negative relationship between click-through rate and number of conversions. The higher click-through rate, the worse your conversions. This is counter to what we should expect to see in this type of data. 
let's break it down. Turns out that there is a cluster of data demarked by three different creatives. Now you can see the trend we'd expect to see that it returns. High click-through rates, more conversions. Let's extend this even further. For example, how would we do this in a regression setting? So recall that the equation of a line is y equals a plus bx, or beta x. Or in algebra, we also often rearrange this a little bit, y equals mx plus b. But it's the same equation. Why is the outcome variable? We always want to plot this on the y-axis. Here in our example, it's conversions. A is the y-intercept, or where the line will intersect the y-axis when x is equal to zero. Then we have b, or what we also call the beta coefficient, is the rate of change in y due to one unit change in x. Here, since this is click-through rates, it's how much y will change given a one percentage point change in x. And then we have x, which is our input variable. You always want to plot this on the x-axis. For our example, it's, again, our click-through rate. So let's drop one set of creatives to keep it simple. And we can add a set of terms to our regression equation that will count the difference between these two groups. And you can always extend this to multiple. So again, b, our beta, is still the same here. It's one unit change in x and how much it corresponds to y. And we create this new variable called d for dummy variable. And this is just a column in our data set that takes a value of 0 for group A, which will be our baseline, and a value of 1 for group B, which will be our comparison group. Our model will now estimate us a second beta. This will be the difference between the intercept of group A and group B. Now, the previous model only gave us a difference in intercepts. We can extend this even further to yield different slopes or different rates of change between group A and group B. To do so, we add one additional term to our regression equation. Our initial beta now should not be interpreted out of context. We have to consider d now. When d is 0, then the beta is still the change in y per one unit change in x. For beta 2, it's still the difference in slopes. But now we have the beta 3. This is going to be the difference in the rate of change between our two groups. It's the incremental increase or decrease from the original beta when d equals 1. So now some parting questions to help you along the way. Do you know your data? What is the level of analysis of your data? And are you making the correct inferences for that level of analysis? So think about your data, and thank you for joining us for A University. <laughs>